Um, okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight uh, for a very uh, special uh, topic, important topic uh, for our um, uh, survivors, cancer survivors. Um, we're going to be discussing weight management um, and cancer. Um, this, as we know, is a very important topic in, uh, for, for management of cancer and also for prevention of um, cancer. Uh, we have a great panel uh, tonight. Um, you know, obesity affects more than 30% of the population in, in the United States. Um, it's even worse for uh, minorities um, when in the, in the Caucasian populations, about 30% for minorities, it could be up to 40% of obesity and we know that obesity is linked to uh, many cancers, uh, breast cancer, esophageal cancer, uh, gastric cancer, many and, and you'll hear um, more um, about that. Um, so I am uh, Dr. Alejandro Perez, I am the director of the breast cancer program at uh, Sylvester Implantation um, and I'm an associate professor of medicine at the University of Miami. Um, I'm joined by uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Elisa Krell uh, she's also a breast uh, medical oncologist, um, and she is the director of outreach uh, for women's health in Aventura, and she also sees patients in Miami and uh, Deerfield. Um, the start of the night uh, is Dr. Michelle Perlman, uh, so we are uh, very happy to have her. I'm very grateful that, um, that she joined us today to, to, to have this lecture uh, for our patients. Um, so, Dr. Perlman, um, is an assistant professor in the Division of Digestive and Liver Diseases at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Perlman is a physician nutrition specialist and board certified in internal medicine, gastroenterology, and obesity medicine. Dr. Perlman is on a mission to educate the community on the fundamentals of wellness and nutrition and works closely with numerous subspecialties, including bariatrics, pathology, endocrinology, sleep medicine, sports medicine, oncology, and, um, and nutrition to provide comprehensive care to patients with uh, nutritional issues, whether it be uh, malnutrition or obesity. Um, so welcome, um, everybody. Uh, we, we're going to proceed with the lecture, uh, but uh, there is a Q&A uh, that you please send all your questions, and we're going to um, address all the questions at the end of the, um, of the lecture. So make sure you send the questions to us. Uh, we'll organize it by topics and, um, and then we'll answer them uh, at the end. Anything you guys wanna add before we start? No, no. looking no. forward to Dr. Perlman's talk. Welcome everybody. Okay, go ahead. All right. Thank you all so much for logging in tonight. I am honored and grateful to have this opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, through my 12, 13 years worth of medical training, unfortunately, no one really ever sat me down to talk to me about nutrition. Um, and so I really kind of learned about it through my own experience, whether it was, you know, going to the gym and understanding how food truly is medicine, how I wanted to, um, in order to feel well, I needed to eat well. And I hope that I um, can really share that with my patients and colleagues and whatnot, because I truly believe that food is medicine and it's all about being consistent with eating properly, not just today, not just tomorrow, but every day if we truly wanna age gracefully uh, with or without a cancer diagnosis. So thank you again all for joining. Um, so again, I'm an assistant professor in the GI division, but really most of what I do now is weight management. Um, my approach really goes back to the basics. Food is medicine. And although we have so many medical advances, whether it's medication, procedures, surgeries, when it comes to weight management, I really harp on the importance that we cannot skip over the basics. And that comes down to lifestyle modification. Many times it breaks my heart in clinic and at the University of Miami, we're a tertiary referral center. Um, people have struggled with weight many times most of their life, or particularly after a cancer diagnosis and treatment, people all of a sudden go through menopause overnight and they gain 30 pounds. And so they really struggle with this. And although we're a tertiary referral center, um, many times I'm often the first person that's ever asked patients, what are they eating on a typical day? And it's not good enough to just say, oh, I have coffee, I have a sandwich, I have a salad, and then I'll have you know, the typical dinner. 
I go into the nitty gritty detail and we'll go into why that's important of how uh, ingredients affect our brain chemistry. So I focus on medical weight loss in particular, pre and post bariatric care, and then bariatric complications. So we use the BMI when we classify people, whether they are normal weight, overweight, and the different classifications of obesity. Unfortunately, it's really not a great tool and it doesn't tell us the whole picture, but it's the easiest calculation that we can get in clinic. So patients come into clinic, we weigh them, we get their height, we plug those numbers into a calculation and we say, okay, based on your BMI, you are in, um, in the classification of class one obesity. Now, it's not that helpful if let's say um, someone just had cancer treatment and they were getting a ton of chemo and they've lost a ton of muscle. And let's say most of their extra fat is actually centralized around their abdomen. So they may have really thin upper body and a really thin lower body and their weight may actually be normal, but they may actually have uh, central obesity because all of that extra weight is around their belly, even though they don't actually classify as being obese. And so we really have to hone in on that particular population because what we know is that the more weight you have around your abdomen, that correlates with what we call visceral adiposity and metabolic syndrome. So the more excess weight you have around your belly, that correlates with fat in your organs, including your liver, your pancreas, and your heart. And so that's really what we need to hone into is that waist circumference. The problem though, is that kind of in healthcare, the BMI is really the easiest metric to get, even though it may not be all that accurate in certain patients. So when we look at a map of overall obesity, these trends are frightening. These are the prevalence of self-reported obesity rates throughout the United States. Here in Florida, it's in yellow. So really about a third of the population are obese. When you also include those who meet criteria for overweight, it's about two thirds of the population. Now keep in mind that this is self-reported. So more often than not, people will under-report. They may not actually um, know or realize that they're actually in the obesity category. So a lot of these numbers may actually be below what they truly are, but, but really the numbers are staggering. Despite all of the medical advances and, and everything that we know when it comes to the importance of maintaining a healthy weight. Um, unfortunately, the prevalence of obesity over the past 20 years has remained about the same. But the more alarming statistic here is that those with a BMI over 40, so those with extreme levels of obesity, that prevalence is actually increasing, and in particular in females and the minority population. Obesity is a disease and it should be evaluated and treated aggressively. It is now overtaking smoking as the leading preventable cause of cancer. And we know that excess body weight is responsible for about 8% of all cancers in the United States and 7% of cancer deaths. But unfortunately, the way that healthcare is set up, a lot of times the common scenario is a patient comes into clinic, they get their height and weight checked, they get their blood pressure checked, they may be talking about the hypertension or the prediabetes. And then it's kind of like the last remark where maybe the physician says, oh, by the way, Billy, you should probably lose some weight because you're, you know, it looks like based on your BMI, you're a little bit overweight. So maybe try to lose 20 pounds, follow up in six months. And if you don't lose the weight, then we'll send you to bariatric surgery. Um, it's not, I, we cannot blame the providers. I think it's just the health system that just makes it very challenging. If you have a healthcare provider that has 20 minutes to go into all of these details. And so you have to understand what's going on with the patient and then actually formulate a plan. And it can be very overwhelming. So there are 13 different types of cancer that we know are associated with extra uh, body weight. So the ones here, so bladder cancer, brain cancer, breast cancer, particularly in postmenopausal patients, colorectal cancer. So I'm a gastroenterologist and I see it. Um, more often than I'd like to, that it's really these patients with metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, prediabetes, hypertension, that have increased risk of colorectal cancer, esophageal cancer, gallbladder cancer. So you name it, 13 cancers associated with excess body weight. Now, in particular, when we talk about breast cancer, we have modifiable risk factors and we have ones that we can't control like genetics. But things that we do control, you know, a lot, I think a lot of times, when the world is so crazy and, and all of these things are going on, 
and we have work and kids to take care of and 10 million responsibilities. I think when a lot of things in life seem out of control, um, it is actually empowering to realize that we have more control over our cancer risk than we realize. So what sort of things do we have control over? These are what we call the lifestyle modifications. So our weight, so reaching a healthier weight or maintaining a healthy weight as life happens, as stress happens, as we get put on more medication, our metabolism slows down, how do you maintain that healthy weight? Um, a sedentary lifestyle increases the risk. So sitting down all day, particularly with the death of Zoom, I'll have patients in the afternoon on a Tuesday and I literally don't get up for four hours because I have Zoom uh, clinic visits back to back. So I think more often than now, the sedentary lifestyle um, a lot of us are staying at home, maybe not as active as we were before, is a big, big problem. Drinking more than one glass of alcohol per day, exposure to radiation, aging, so obviously we can't stop that. Um, and other things that we can't stop would be a family history of breast cancer, any sort of inherited genetic mutations. Um, so those are things we can't, but we do have control over a, a wide array of things. Um, and I think that can be very empowering for people. So when we look at, in particular, breast cancer risk and weight, um, it's actually, uh, particularly in postmenopausal patients, that they are 1.2 to 1.4 times as likely to have breast cancer um, in patients who are uh, obese or overweight. Now, there are many mechanisms as to um, why do people who are overweight or obese tend to develop more cancers? Um, so these are some of the mechanisms. So we have fat tissue that produces extra uh, estrogen. So that may correlate with increased risk of breast, endometrial, and ovarian cancer. We have growth factors. So things like insulin and IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factors. So these are growth factors. So as you can imagine, if you have metabolic syndrome or prediabetes or diabetes, you have higher levels of insulin because your body doesn't see it. And so it keeps pumping out more and more insulin. So those growth factors may actually be risk factors for certain cancers, including colorectal cancer. Um, having extra weight is often associated with chronic inflammatory con uh, conditions. It increases oxidative stress on a systemic level that can cause DNA damage. Um, you know, back when I was an undergrad, I was always taught that our fat cells, they're called um, adipocytes, that they were just inert, that fat cells just kind of sat there and didn't do anything. But what we know more and more now with data is that they are incredibly active and they produce hormones like, um, and, and these actually can inhibit cell growth or stimulate certain cells to grow and they actually affect tumor immunity. So fat cells are actually incredibly active and pro-inflammatory. And, and having extra weight can also lead to difficulties in screening and management as some imaging modalities may not be as accurate in those uh, patients. So I get these questions all the time. Um, does losing weight actually lower the risk of cancer? Um, it really just depends on the cancer in many cases. Some studies do suggest that losing weight will reduce your risk of breast, endometrial, colon, and prostate cancer. Um, when you look at postmenopausal women, losing at least 5% of your body weight was associated with a lower risk of obesity-related cancers. And studies have also shown that bariatric surgery among patients with obesity, particularly in women, is associated with um, reduction in overall cancers. Now, in those patients that have been diagnosed with cancer, is it beneficial um, for those who are overweight or obese to lose weight? I think a lot of times when we see a thin person, um, many times we think someone must be ill, or if someone's lost 30 pounds, we often assume that someone has become sick. And so I think a large part of it is a cultural bias um, or social norms, where if we see someone that's losing weight unintentionally, it makes many people uncomfortable, particularly when someone gets a diagnosis of cancer. And so oftentimes it's the family members or the friends or the coworkers that are really encouraging the patient to eat whatever calories they can so they can maintain their weight, even though they may be starting out um, being overweight or obese. And so we really have to look at the data and say, well, maybe you know they're losing weight unintentionally, which is not a good thing, but it would be great if we can at least maintain a normal weight um, during the cancer treatment and then post-treatment um, can, can definitely be helpful in certain types of cancer. 
So we're going to go over a typical scenario. These are scenarios that I see on a daily basis. So this was back um, probably around three to four years ago when I was just starting as faculty here. So we have a 50 year old female. She has metastatic breast cancer. She's had a lumpectomy, chemotherapy and radiation. She's had poor wound healing post-op and experiences a lot of pain. She's interested in a breast reduction to improve her quality of life. And she's been evaluated by plastic surgery. And she was told not uncommonly that she needs to lose weight prior to surgery um, prior to her breast reduction surgery, so it's more successful and that she optimizes her wound healing and post-operative course. Her BMI is 41 and she's got a whole host of comorbid conditions. So she has fatty liver, high blood pressure and heartburn, and she's had many unsuccessful weight loss attempts in the past. So often when patients come to me, um, I will start off by saying, what brings you to the clinic and, and why do you wanna lose weight? Because everyone has their own story. And my goal is to figure out what is your why? Is it because you wanna reduce your risk of breast cancer recurrence? Is it because you wanna improve your post-operative recovery from a, a breast surgery? Do you wanna run around with your grandkids and not get short of breath? Do you wanna reduce your arthritis so that you can move your body more and not be in pain every day? So if I can resonate with their why and tailor the recommendations appropriately, that's how we really improve our rates of success is connecting with the patient and figuring out how can I meet them where they are and help them reach whatever goal they may have. So this patient in particular, she wants to be healthy. She understands that being overweight increases her risk of breast cancer recurrence. And uh, most importantly for her, she's having a ton of pain. She has a lot of back pain from her weight. She's got arthritis. Some of this is medication related. Um, and then I ask her, well, what are some obstacles that you think have prevented you from losing weight? And again, this is not an uncommon response. She doesn't know what she should be eating. She's, there's so much misinformation out there that she doesn't know if she should do keto, low carb, Adkins, Mediterranean. She really hasn't been given much guidance and she has so much joint pain and fatigue that she really can't do the exercise that she truly wants to do. And unfortunately, weight loss is not this simple. I was actually, even when I was an undergrad, I was told that it is just a numbers game. As long as you take in less than you, than you burn, you will lose weight. And it's actually incredibly more complicated more than that. So it's not just about cutting calories to 800 per day and switching to diet soda and artificial sweeteners and just moving our body more. Although calorie restriction and energy expenditure are part of the equation, they are not the equation and it's much more complicated. And then you have information overload or misinformation. Now everyone is their own influencer on social media and everyone's promoting one supplement over another or their exercise program or some diet that they're trying to sell. And so the biggest, you know, the hardest part is being able to curate all that information and figuring out what is actually evidence-based and what is healthy for one person may not be healthy for another. And what is quote unquote healthy may not actually help you lose weight or maintain a healthy weight. And so kind of going through all of that and figuring out, well, with all that information, how is it going to apply to me? And am I similar to the person who is giving the plan or am I that person that's, you know, the, the uh, target population is a whole nother story. So I get these questions all the time and I'm sure you all ask these questions a lot to your provider and I'm sure providers get these questions all the time. Is fat bad? Are carbs the enemy? How much is too much protein? And should I do keto? And what about intermittent fasting? These are all very common questions and very valid questions. Now, I also struggle with this. As a provider, if I have, let's say, 40 minutes to see a new patient, I'm meeting someone for the very first time. I have to be able to establish a rapport prior to discussing often a very sensitive topic when it comes to weight. I have to learn about all of a patient's comorbid conditions, about their prior failed weight loss attempts, their coping strategies when it comes to stress, anxiety, depression. What does their family unit look like and their support system? What is their budget and their time constraints? Are they working at home or are they going into the office? Do they travel a lot and they have to eat out all the time? What are their food preferences, their food intolerances, their allergies? 
And then within that same 40 minute period, how do I teach them nutrition basics and then counsel them on realistic goals and create a personalized plan in 40 minutes? It is a challenge and I struggle with it. And I think, again, we can't really blame the healthcare providers. It's just the way the system is set up it's like opening up Pandora's box. And I have the luxury where I can spend the entire visit going through the nitty gritty details, but a lot of providers don't have that luxury. So what is a fad diet? These are very trendy. They are quick weight loss plans. They promise quick results and they're often very temporary and very restrictive. And so if I put anyone on a diet, you know, often people come to me to lose weight. And what's interesting is that's actually not my goal. I can get anyone to lose a significant amount of weight in a short period of time if I starve them. Um, it's actually quite simple, but that's not my goal. And so the problem is, is that people will go on these HCG diets, they do the injections, they cut their appetite, and they're eating 500 calories per day. They're literally having like two pieces of celery, two ounces of chicken, some spinach, um, and maybe a shrimp, and that gets them to 800 calories a day. And they may not be hungry, and they may lose 30 pounds in a month and they feel great. But as soon as they come off of the medication, they gain the weight. And not only do they gain the initial weight that they lost, but they gain even more. And why is that? When your body goes into starvation mode and you lose a large amount of weight in a short period of time, although people want that to happen, it is not healthy. We end up actually losing a ton of muscle. And we know that the muscle is key to our metabolism. And so patients will often come to me after they've done Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, Adkins, HCG, you name it, they've done it. And they say, oh, but this diet worked for me. When in fact it didn't, it may have worked in the short term, but in the long term, it actually made it very easy for them to regain the weight. And they often come to me when they're at their heaviest weight. Um, so although people want to lose weight fast, it's actually not the ideal scenario. The hard part is not actually losing the weight, it's maintaining that weight loss as life happens. Um, so I really go back to this approach as food is medicine. Again, people show up to my clinic, they say, doc, how can I lose 30 pounds? I focus on how can I uh, meet someone where they are at whatever the age they are with whatever comorbidities they have, how can I teach them how to eat for their body today not their body when they were 20 years old, because oftentimes today it's vastly different. How can I teach them how to eat so that they feel better? It improves their quality of life. And as a result, they will lose weight. And I think, you know, equally important, not only what you eat, but how you eat is very important. You know, we are taught from when we are children, when we can eat and, and what to eat. So when we go to school, we have to have breakfast before school. We have lunch at a designated time. We get an afternoon snack. We maybe eat something when we get home and then we have dinner and then maybe milk and cookies before, before we go to bed. And so we are given these man-made times of when we are to eat, irrespective of whether or not we're actually hungry. And so many people don't truly understand what hunger feels like or they get the, they get the signals mixed up. So they feel this hunger. Um, they feel this urge, this craving to eat, um, when it may just be a hunger for something. It may not be hunger for food. It may be hunger for companionship or hunger to move their body or they're hungry for just a good night's rest. But oftentimes the most convenient way to, to satisfy that hunger is actually to go to the pantry and grab some chips because that sends reward signals to our brain. It makes us feel good at least just in the short term, I'll bet not the long term. And healthy eating varies from person to person. So typically in January, I get a lot of patients for bloating um, and heartburn because they're trying to get on this New Year's kick to eat healthier. And they go on Instagram and they see, oh, I should be making cauliflower out of everything. So they start eating heads and heads of cauliflower or they're adding lemon to all this water and having lemon water. And they start having tons of heartburn and bloating. And so just because something has nutrients doesn't mean it's actually going to make someone feel well or help them get to a healthy weight. Um, and so that, that really comes down to this point of just because something has nutrients does not mean it is quote unquote healthy or will make you feel well. And food allergies and intolerances can develop at any age. Our body becomes less and less tolerant 
of garbage food as we get older. So more often than not, people will, let's say, have pizza for dinner and they'll come to my office and they'll say, Doc, what is wrong with my body? I used to be able to eat half a pizza when I was 20 and feel fine. And now I have half a pizza and I feel awful. What is wrong with me? And although we will do our due diligence and make sure there's nothing more concerning going on, more often than not, it is not something wrong with the body. It is something wrong with the ingredients that we're eating and our body is trying to protect us and say, maybe pizza is not a good option. Um, and, and it's really just paying attention to our body and understanding, particularly with cancer and after cancer treatment, our microbiome changes and our body changes because our hormones change. And so what we were able to eat when we were 20, we will not be able to get away with when we're 50 and still feel the same. And that is so incredibly important. And so the hardest part about my job, it's not doing procedures, it's not giving medications. Um, the hardest part about my job is teaching grown adults that what we think are normal eating behaviors, what we grew up on as culturally and socially normal um, are actually making the majority of us very, very ill. And so that's, that's truly the hardest part about what I do. Um, and so it's so important to remember that our body changes from day to day internal uh, factors, external factors. And so just as everything else in our body changes and our environment changes, our nutrition has to be just as dynamic. So what is actually um, included in this obesity management? What do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? I offer medical nutritional therapy. Um, that really um, is just a fancy word for, I teach adults how to eat for their body today. I do medications, so pharmacotherapy in certain individuals, endobariatrics, which is the intragastric balloon, which is a six month program that can help people lose weight. And then I don't do bariatrics myself, but I work very closely with my bariatric colleagues to try to figure out who are good candidates for uh, the gastric sleeve or gastric bypass. So obesity is multifactorial. Um, really my approach and, and really what the guidelines show is it needs to be patient-centered and an individualized and personalized approach. It is not a one-size-fits-all. So I can't just tell someone, do Weight Watchers, do Jenny Craig, do Mediterranean, because people may have food allergies or intolerances, or they may not have access to certain foods, or they may not like certain foods. And so I have to figure out all of those things to create a nutritional plan for someone. Now, I don't actually use the term diet because oftentimes when we talk about diet, people think it's a restrictive thing, it's a short-term thing, and once they lose the weight and get to their goal weight, they'll be able to eat whatever they were eating before that. And so I like to use the term um, nutritional plan because this is a lifelong thing that has to happen. It is not just a 30-day plan and then they go back to what they were doing before if they truly want to maintain um, that healthy weight. And so things that um, take play in, in whatever my individual plan is, is going to be the patient's age, their gender, their genetics, their individual physiology, their economic status with their budget, what foods do they like and what do they not like, what is their physical activity, what are their limitations, what sort of medications are they on and other comorbid conditions. And then how do I also understand what is their home environment, what is their work environment, um, you know, what sort of behavioral modifications do we need to work on? Do they tend to eat when they're stressed, anxious, bored, happy, sad? Um, we do this motivational interviewing and, and I like to integrate um, apps and social media to help educate people and keep people engaged. Wearable technologies like step trackers can be very helpful. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that take play um, in giving someone a plan. So my approach, kind of the nuts and bolts, is it's this personalized approach. I wanna understand what other medical conditions do they have? What do they like to eat and not like to eat? What sort of foods make them feel bad? Um, any sort of uh, global kind of GI symptoms, whether it's heartburn, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, their budget and time constraints. So this is just a small snippet of things that I need to take into account when I develop a plan for a patient. And I also wanna mention that um, I can't guarantee that someone leaves my office and they get to their goal weight within six months. Um, I do the best obviously that I can and I use evidence-based medicine to figure out the best approach, but it is truly a partnership. Um, I don't have an agenda when a patient comes to my clinic. I go over the nuts and bolts. I try to teach them the basics of nutrition. I tackle 
of the low hanging fruit on things that they can start working on. And then it's a partnership. If things aren't working, I advise my patients to reach out to me and to keep me in the loop so that we can troubleshoot along the way. The last thing I wanna do is give someone a plan, say follow up in three to six months and they struggle with it and they need extra help. And then we've wasted six months of their time. And then I find that out six months later. So I always encourage people to stay engaged and keep me in the loop. So um, briefly, cause I don't want to kind of get in the weeds about this because everyone is different. But in general, when it comes to the dietary recommendations, I set three objective goals on that initial visit. So it's not good enough to just tell a patient you need to eat less and move more. I'll see you back in six months. So I focus on particularly the liquid beverages. I look at what sort of sugars or creamers are they adding to the coffee? Are they drinking soda or juice? So really the goal here is to limit the liquid calories and in particular, the sugar. So eliminating soda, getting rid of concentrated juices and also cow's milk as cow's milk is pro-inflammatory and also contains sugar, even though it doesn't taste sweet. Um, so really avoiding the added sugars. A lot of people get them in their beverages, but then also looking at where are they getting them in their foods? Are they using jelly on their PB&J sandwich? Are they adding honey or are they adding artificial sweeteners like Splenda and really getting used to using natural sugar options like fruit? Um, when we use a ton of artificial sweeteners, although they are marketed as diet food products, they actually promote weight gain. They mess up our hormonal signals, our satiety signals. They are 300 to 600 times sweeter than natural sugar. So we're, our brain becomes used to a sweetness level up here. So when we have plain Greek yogurt or berries, that tastes bitter to a lot of people. So what do most people do? They add honey or they add granola or they add monk fruit. So it just tastes normal when in fact, it's, it's just way too sweet. And, and really when it comes to cravings and hunger, most of us are always hungry. And a lot of it doesn't come down to calories, it comes down to ingredients. How do these ingredients, particularly sugar and salt, affect our brain, stimulate thirst, and stimulate cravings for more sugar? So if we eliminate or reduce the added sugars and the salt, people often realize that their cravings and hunger reduce significantly. And then the last part is really avoiding trans fats, particularly those in fried foods. When it comes to medication, not everyone is a candidate. So it's typically for patients with a BMI over 27 and a comorbid condition like high blood pressure, sleep apnea, hypertension, um, or those with a BMI over 30. Um, so really the first line, medications don't work um, if we skip over the lifestyle modifications. So that goes back to um, dietary counseling, increasing physical activity is tolerated and really offering that psychological support and mental health um, support. So medications are just tools, just like surgery. They do not do all the work for us. They will never cancel out the lifestyle modification. They are a tool to help with the transition of cutting calories and, and kind of taking off the edge with that hunger and cravings. Um, so I use medications um, quite frequently to help with that transition. And then you have surgery, whether it's the sleeve or the bypass. Again, I don't do that, but, but um, many patients are candidates for that if they are interested. Um, so when it comes to obesity and cancer, we really need to focus on being aggressive with the obesity treatment. It's not good enough for us to just say, eat less and move more. We really wanna be aggressive about it when it comes to the dietary modification increasing exercises tolerated and really promoting the maintenance or increasing the muscle mass as that's incredibly important for our metabolism and even more importantly for our independence. Once you lose your muscle and you can't get out of a chair, you have lost your independence. Engaging in regular physical activity. So although exercise is not a great weight loss tool on its own, it is incredibly important for every other aspect of our body whether it's reducing the fat in our liver, sensitizing our body to insulin, improving our mental well-being, and when our mind is in a better place, we make better eating decisions. So it's incredibly important for maintaining weight loss. Um, and then considering comorbidities and obviously treat those simultaneously, many of the medications that I use to help people lose weight, I will change them or, um, or pick ones depending on what sort of comorbid conditions people have like prediabetes or diabetes. And then following the American Cancer Society guidelines for diet and physical activity are also very important. 
And then just lastly here, so future diet-related cancer research. Unfortunately, diet studies are actually very complicated. One being because it's so heterogeneous. A lot of people also don't remember what they eat on a typical day. Um, so we remember the big things like, oh, I had a pizza last night, but maybe we forgot that we added creamer to our coffee or we added a packet of monk fruit to our coffee, or we added some you know, Mrs. Dash seasoning to our meal. We don't pay attention to that sort of stuff. So it's very hard to do a really kind of randomized controlled dietary studies because there's so many confounding factors. Um, there's also a lot of conflicting data when we look at these studies. A lot of them are based on dietary recall and you know, people aren't locked up in a hospital and we're monitoring every single thing that they're eating. And I think future research is really gonna be looking at um, not so much as saying, you know, okay, milk is associated with X, Y, and Z, but looking at whole food plant-based diets and is that sort of um, food regimen correlated with reduction in cancer risk? So looking at more kind of dietary patterns as opposed to dietary items specifically. And then really trying to understand whether implementing a weight loss program, particularly after a breast cancer diagnosis, um, affects disease-free survival and recurrence in overweight and obese women. And then really also looking at, well, how much weight loss is important? Is it 5% of your weight, 10%? Um, how long do you need to keep that weight off? So lots of things that we need to study that we don't quite know yet. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you all here with some resources. I have a website also with a lot of nutrition information. There's a lot of support services through Sylvester, whether it's exercise physiology or the nutrition um, group. There's a bunch of dietitians within Sylvester. You have CDC guidelines um, and also the cancer website with a lot of information on how to reduce your risk of cancer with dietary changes. So we will provide this PowerPoint after the talk so that you all have these links as well and then access to my slides. Okay, so that's it for me. I know I spoke very fast. There was just a lot of information to cover and now we'll open up to a panel discussion. Great, it was excellent. Thank you so much. And I, I learned so much. Um, so yeah, we have, uh, we have some questions. Um, so the first question that came, we, we talked a lot about uh, weight management, obesity, um, but there, there was a question about weight loss uh, during cancer treatment. Um, so do you wanna comment about a few words about it? Yeah, so I think it's just a, you know, um, people don't wanna lose weight during treatment um, because, you know, that um, they're just afraid that if you lose too much weight, obviously you're gonna, you know, be malnourished and, and mal being malnourished is associated with poor outcomes when it comes to um, tolerating cancer treatment and, and outcomes after cancer treatment. But I think it's just very important to remember that although we don't wanna lose a ton of weight during cancer treatment, it is still equally as important to eat very healthy and to nourish our body that although we may be losing some weight with treatment, it's not good enough to just eat whatever calories we can get in. I see a lot of patients who have, let's say, diarrhea or heartburn or bloating, um, whether it's related to the chemotherapy or whatnot. And so if they eat a bunch of ice cream and pizza just to get those calories in, they're gonna be running to the bathroom. So my goal is to focus on nutrient dense foods. How can we get them particularly protein rich foods, good fats, not large volume. They're not gonna tolerate a whole head of broccoli, but maybe they'll tolerate steamed broccoli and then you do a puree and then you add in some avocado there and maybe you know um, some bone broth. And that's a good way to get fiber, good fat and good protein, but it's not gonna give you major GI symptoms that's gonna send you to the bathroom. So it's really promoting nutrient dense, protein rich food so that you feel well and tolerate the treatment um, is very important. Yeah, and, and a similar question, uh, somebody else um, asked, uh, do you treat weight loss, gain, loss or gain on someone receiving cancer treatment differently and how? So you, mm -hmm. you mentioned that. Yeah, so it, um, I guess there's, it's twofold. So if someone is losing unintentional weight um, and they can't keep their weight and so they're very malnourished, that's where I, I again, really focus on the nutrient dense, calorie dense, protein dense foods um, many people, you know, it's about, you know, eating, let's say every two hours to get the appropriate calories. So we want to, you know, not keep losing unintentional weight, but at least maintain that weight and get good um, calories and good nutrients. Now, the flip side is, do I help people lose weight who need to lose weight during cancer treatment? And absolutely. Um, but again, it kind of comes back to how is the, how is the cancer treatment 
affecting their body? And then how can I get them the adequate nutrients? It's not about starvation, but it's about promoting adequate nutrients to get them to a healthier weight. So I help people on both sides of the spectrum, whether it's gaining weight or losing weight, but really getting to that healthier weight. Okay, we have another question about uh, that I think you answered about diet pills, but maybe because obviously not everybody can get in to see you and many providers are uneducated about this. What are, um, what medications do you favor for helping people lose weight in particular that they can talk to their primary care doctors about? Yeah, absolutely. So when people think about diet pills, I think a lot of times all they think about is like stimulants, like Fenfen and things like that, that were taken off the market. There's a million diet pills out kind of over the counter in GNC and vitamin shop. I do not recommend any of those because they are not FDA regulated. I've actually seen quite a few cases of acute liver failure where people need liver transplantation, taking some of these over-the-counter over diet pills with things as simple as green tea extract in some of these supplements. Wow. So when we talk about diet pills, those are not the ones that I'm referring to. So what are some of the medications that I give on a routine basis? So we have our stimulants. Those are things like fentramine that is not fenfen. That is typically given to people who are on the healthier side. So if you have a um, um, history of heart disease or hypertension, or insomnia, then fentramine is not gonna be a good option for you. But for my otherwise young and otherwise healthy patients, if they need to kind of get something to just kind of take off the edge and reduce their hunger, then fentramine can be an option. That's really the only stimulant that I use. Another option is a fat blocker called Ally. The other name for it is Zenical or Orlistat. I rarely use that because it's a fat blocker and it actually gives people like fecal incontinence. And most people, don't wanna to have to wear diapers. So I actually very rarely use that medication. Um, another medication, it's a dual combo, it's called Contrave. So that is Welbutrin plus Naltrexone. Um, so, the Welbu so I use that medication, particularly in patients who have stress-related eating or like binge eating tendencies related to stress or anxiety. So the Welbutrin is an antidepressant. It will help with kind of the stress eating or sadness related eating. The naltrexone is actually a medication we give to people who drink a lot of alcohol, but it affects the brain to kind of help with those urges. Um, then we have another medication called Qsimia. That is a combination of the fentramine, which I already mentioned, plus Topamax. So the Topamax will help people um, kind of sleep at night. Um, it, it's kind of, it makes people a little bit sedated. And then the fentramine again is, is a stimulant. Um, Topamax makes people feel a little bit dopey. Um, so a lot of my patients don't really like that feeling and it can sometimes affect memory. So I don't give that medication all that often. And then the last one, which I've been uh, using a lot of is semaglutide. So the other name for that is Ozempic. Um, so that is an injection, it's once a week. It basically stimulates a hormone that your body already makes called glucagon-like peptide one or GLP-1. That is a satiety hormone. So your small intestine releases it, it sends a signal back to your brain and it says, brain, I'm full. And then as soon as you feel full, you stop eating. It also works because it delays your stomach emptying. So the food stays in your stomach longer than it otherwise would have. So contraindications to Ozempic are a personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer. The other issue um, can be if you have rip roaring heartburn or bloating or regurgitation because it slows down gastric emptying, it can often make those symptoms worse. But the key to reducing side effects is listening to your body. You have to cut your portions in half from the get-go. And as soon as you feel full, you stop eating. And that will often help minimize those side effects. Now, part of the issue why some people are not on the medication um, is actually cost. A lot of insurance companies don't cover it and it can be quite cost prohibitive for some people. So, um, so I use a lot of Ozempic, but those are kind of all the medications that we have that I use quite commonly. Okay, another question. Uh, what is the difference between endobariatric and bariatric? Yeah, so endobariatrics is basically, I offer the procedure where it's an intragastric balloon. So you get an endoscopy. So I put a tube into your mouth. I actually insert a balloon we inflate the balloon with saline into your stomach and it's basically like a breast implant that just uh, stays in your stomach. 
So it actually has um, effects on that satiety hormone called GLP-1. And it also is a space occupying thing in your stomach. So it makes you feel full. So it's basically a procedure that acts like um, that acts like the Ozempic. So if people need to, let's say, lose 30 pounds or so, and they want to lose it in a uh, kind of shorter period of time, the balloon stays in the stomach for about six months, and it can definitely help people lose weight. Um, so that is different from bariatrics because the balloon ends up being removed at the end of six months. Bariatric procedures are surgical procedures. So that would be things like the gastric sleeve, where they remove a large part of the stomach, or the gastric bypass, where they remove the majority of the stomach and then bypass the first portion of the small intestine. Um, and that way you kind of malabsorb calories that way. So, so one is a little bit more invasive, um, although we have better long-term data with the actual surgical procedures, but, but both can be helpful. Okay, um, we have one other question about um, the role of microbiome in, in weight loss and what one can do about either analyzing it or changing it and making it more um, um, uh, pro-weight pro loss. Yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, more and more research is actually going into how can we uh, modify the microbiome to promote a favorable environment to help us with weight loss. You know, a lot of patients come to me and they say, doc, it must be my thyroid. My thyroid must be, you know, off kilter. That's why I've gained weight. And of course I check the thyroid and more often than not, the thyroid is always normal. And so we often kind of equate the thyroid with metabolism, but it's so much more than that. It's only a small part of the picture. What else plays a role in metabolism? It's our other hormones. So our estrogen or testosterone, um, like I mentioned, it is our muscle mass. So it's not that our metabolism all of a sudden shuts down at the age of 40 or 50. It's that oftentimes when we get into the career force, we stop moving, we're not as active. And so although our weight may be going up, our muscle mass has gone down. And so our metabolism slows down. Um, and so all of those things play a role in why someone can't eat like they did when they were 20 and still be the weight that they were when they were 20. But what we do know is our microbiome plays a huge role in metabolism. So you have one person that let's say eats a carrot and they say, doc, I gained five pounds after a carrot. And then you have another person who's been blessed and they go to um, a buffet and they eat 3000 calories and they lose two pounds. So everyone's always jealous of that person, right? Um, it's, you know, part of the issue is that um, it depends on the microbiome, the bacteria in our gut. And the, and the bacteria in our gut actually play a huge role in the way that our body extracts calories from the foods that we're eating. So we're looking more and more into, can I give someone a strain of a bacteria um, that will um, make a more favorable environment to help someone lose weight? So I think that's where a lot of the research is going as far as future um, weight loss treatments. Now, if someone had mentioned, can you analyze the microbiome? There are plenty of studies out there or um, tests that you can do that will study the microbiome. The problem is we have no clue how to interpret that data. So patients will come to me, whether it's a food sensitivity test or a microbiome um, analysis, and they'll say, doc, what should I eat? And they'll say, look at the packet. And I say, honestly, I don't need to look at the packet. It's honestly just very confusing for me and for you. Why don't we just talk about what you're eating and how can we make adjustments? Um, and that's really what's most important to me. So in general, how do we promote a healthy gut microbiome? It's feeding our body well. Our gut is our largest immune organ. And it's not just eating healthy one day or one meal out of the day. It's about eating healthy every day consistently um, over the long haul. And the dietary fiber feeds our gut bacteria. And that's really what helps promote a, a healthy microbiome. For people who are doing like the ketogenic diet and not getting any fiber, it really destroys the gut. Okay, um, um, another one about um, exercise. And, and of course, this is mostly about nutrition, but I see you exercising all the time, Dr. Perlman, on, on your Instagram. Uh, so I know that's uh, very important to you as well, to all of us. Um, so a uh, question about how to eliminate visceral fat. Which one is more effective, cardio or resistance training? Yeah, so um, it's definitely a combination. Um, part of it comes down to, well, what do people enjoy? Okay, so if someone hates weight training, then I'm not gonna say you need to go to the gym five days a week because then they're just not gonna do anything. So understanding, okay, do you like getting on the bike? Do you like getting in the pool? 
Do you have weights or resistance bands at home? What do you have access to? And what are you actually willing to do? Because at the end of the day, most people just need to move their body more. It is not that complicated. Um, so moving your body more on a consistent basis. If you have, let's say, joint pains from tamoxifen and you say, okay, I'm going to do two hours of, of um, weight training and cardio on Saturday, and I'll get my two hours in that the Cancer Society recommends. Well, you better believe that the rest of the week, your body's going to feel awful. So it's better to do, let's say, 20 or 30 minutes every day consistently, and your joints will respond better to that. So don't try to do it all in a day just to meet those requirements. So consistency is key. So it's really about what do you like to do? What do you have access to do? And what are you willing to do on a consistent basis? Those are very important. Um, cardio is important for our cardiovascular system. So our heart, our lungs, um, for our bone density, if you're doing some walking, but resistance training is equally as important. Um, and so when it comes to getting fat out of the liver or fat out of the organs, it's really doing moderate activity 45 minutes to an hour, three to five days per week, and doing something that you enjoy. So we don't necessarily have to overcomplicate it. Can acupuncture, is there any data on acupuncture controlling craving and overeating? So I'm not actually sure about the data per se. I do have um, a handful of patients that do acupuncture. It's always nice if we can get it covered by insurance. Um, it can definitely help with, with joint pains and stress and anxiety. And so if people tend to have like stress or anxiety related eating, I think it could be very helpful. Um, I work actually with a social worker who does cognitive behavioral therapy and hypnosis, teaches people meditation and healthy coping strategies. So it really just depends on what makes you feel good, what helps get your mind in a better place, because that will then influence you in making better eating decisions. So I think everyone is different, but I don't necessarily know the data on, on the acupuncture itself. Yeah, and um, that, that question comment was made by our acupuncturist, actually, Dr. Campiano, and, um, and she feels strongly about it, that, that it could really help with uh, that And uh, what first steps would you tell somebody who's trying to lose weight and who hasn't, hasn't done this before? Yeah, it's hard. And so my goal is um, objective goals. So not just saying, okay, I know I need to eat healthier. I know I need to eat more veggies. Um, we need objective goals. So I will give people particular metrics. I'll say, okay, goal number one is within the next few weeks, I want you removing the cow's milk from your diet. And if that's the only thing you change in the next month, that is still making progress. I don't expect people to make perfect choices. No one's perfect, but it's about making better choices on a consistent, um, on a consistent basis. So getting rid of the added sugars and getting rid of the excess sodium. So I start with the beverages. So look at your beverages. Are you drinking juice? Are you drinking soda? Are you adding sweeteners to your coffee or your tea? Start with that. Start getting rid of those additives and you'll realize that your cravings and hunger go down and then it's easier to restrict your calories. Um, so that would be the first thing. And then um, eating more of a whole food plant-based diet. So that's different for everyone. I'm not saying you have to go vegan, but what we do know is how do we replenish that healthy gut microbiome? It's about eating nuts and seeds and fruits and vegetables and whole grains and getting rid of a lot of the processed junk. Um, if you can't identify the meat, if it's in like a sausage or something, we probably shouldn't be eating it. So really being able to identify the food that we're eating, those are the types of foods we should be eating on a consistent basis. And why cow's milk out of curiosity? There are certain studies that say, you know, drinking milk with breakfast does improve weight loss. Um, why do you, um, not recommend drinking uh, dairy products or eating or drinking dairy products? Yeah, I think those studies are probably found, um, funded by the dairy industry. So I actually commented um, on a study, I forget what site it was on, but it was funded by the dairy industry and it was saying how they were trying to promote how breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And we used to say that all the time, but the data doesn't actually support that. Why do you think the dairy industry says that? It's because the majority of people consume the majority of their dairy in the morning. They have their eggs, they have their um, milk in their coffee, they have their milk with their cereal. Um, that's when people tend to have it. Um, so we gotta just look back at the data and what it actually supports. In general, um, dairy is pro-inflammatory. So I'm not saying we need to be um, completely off dairy, but cow's milk in particular has sugar. I don't care if it's 
um, skim milk, 2% or whole milk, there's 12 grams of sugar in there, even though it doesn't taste sweet. So I just want people to be strategic about their dairy. If they want dairy, then having, let's say, a plain Greek yogurt would be a better option because you get calcium, probiotics, and 16 grams of protein. Another question, and we're, we're almost done, but another question about uh, what's the criteria to, for, for, uh, medic for medication? Uh-huh. So the criteria for medication um, are people with a BMI over 27 and a comorbid condition or a BMI over 30. Now, I don't necessarily use those guidelines because I have plenty of patients who are pre-diabetic with a BMI of 25 or 26, and I will use medications um, like metformin or like Ozempic to help people lose weight, even if their BMI isn't 27. So the main, the main one that's really kind of a, you can't really change it is spentermine because it's a controlled substance. So pharmacies just won't give it to patients if the BMI is less than 27. But really the other ones are fair game, at least the way that I practice. And one more question, thoughts, because our patients often love to do this because they think it's very healthy. What are your thoughts on juicing fruits and vegetables? Yeah, I mean, we didn't have juicers um, um, or blenders when we were cavemen. And so the issue here is, yeah, I mean, juicing fresh fruit is still healthier than going to Smoothie King or getting a soda. But when we look at how fast things empty from our stomach, liquids empty faster from our stomach than solid food. So if you drink 200 calories worth of a juice versus eat 200 calories, you're going to be hungrier soon after drinking the juice. The other issue is that if you're juicing mainly fruits, you're getting all of the sugar, but none of the fiber. And so you may be having, let's say 60 grams of sugar, you may be getting nutrients, but you're also getting 60 grams of sugar. Particularly those who are going through chemotherapy, juices are hyperosmolar, meaning there's a lot of sugar and not enough salt. And so if you're juicing a lot, that can actually worsen the diarrhea as well. Um, you can literally put the kitchen and the sink into a smoothie. And so people will often put peanut butter and yogurt and honey and two cups of fruit and spinach and you name it, it's in the smoothie. They end up drinking a smoothie that is 800 calories when they would have never actually eaten everything that they put in the smoothie. So we tend to actually overconsume calories when we do juices and smoothies. And one more question about intermittent fasting, which is quite yeah, the we topic. Can't, we can't have this talk without talking about intermittent fasting, that's for sure. Got to end on that. <laughs> There's actually, you know, more and more data coming out that intermittent fasting is not necessarily any better than any sort of other diets or nutritional plans out there. The way that I think it's is that it's helpful is that if you, you know, we shouldn't be eating at 10 o'clock at night. We shouldn't be eating within three to four hours of sleeping. And so if it helps someone to say kitchen's closed at 6 p.m., then that can be very helpful because then they're less likely to go into the kitchen and mindlessly eat. So if that helps people with a degree of restriction to say, okay, I'm not going to eat after 6 p.m., I think that's great. In general, we should just eat when we're hungry. I think intermittent fasting sometimes can be helpful because it teaches people what true hunger feels like, and they're not just, you know, roaming around the kitchen looking for something to eat. Um, and so again, that restriction can be helpful where maybe they don't even go into the kitchen until 10 a.m., um, so that can be helpful. It helps people understand what true hunger is, but it also doesn't mean that just because you fast 16 hours, that during the remaining eight hours, you can eat whatever you want. Um, it still comes back to eating good nutrient dense foods that are going to nourish your body, not just provide empty calories. Um, so it works for some people, but um, I really just want people to break the fast whenever they're hungry, whether that is 7 a.m., 10 a.m. or noon, that is their quote unquote breakfast. Um, and it just depends on the person. That's great. I, I, I learned so much. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. I, I think this was a great lecture. Um, I wanna thank Karen uh, for helping us uh, put this together. Uh, and of course, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Perlman, Dr. Krell uh, for joining us and, um, and everybody who attended.